Okay. So welcome everybody. And um, today's session is specifically on making you aware of some of the common mistakes made by students in preparing for the exam. And I especially want to talk to or address some of the problems that students who are resitting have and maybe some of the mistakes they are not aware of and therefore I want to highlight it to you. Today yeah. is not about uh, you waking up at four o'clock in the morning to study, although that's good if you do that. Um, it is not about studying all day. That would be rather inefficient. So we want to look at some of the problem areas that students may not be aware of the kind of mistakes that they're making. Now, there's this book that I'm reading. It's called Atomic Habits by James Clear. It's an awesome book, right? And it speaks about this thing called at atomic habits. And an atom is really very, very small. But when you have an atom bomb, the effects are really quite huge, quite catastrophic, if you're talking about a bomb, that is. So here is talking about small incremental changes to the habits. And of course, today's session is more in relation to triple A. All right. So how we can make some tiny changes in our study habits for triple A and how that is going to add marks. Just like, for example, if you're trying to save money, you would put in coins into a little piggy bank on a daily basis. Just add a little bit uh, at a time. And there is that compounding effect of your savings as well. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. So even though we may be making small savings um, in your marks a little bit at a time, when you add them all together, it can really be quite substantial. So... Every student wants to pass. Many students, they study and they practice questions and they still fail. So the pass rate for triple A is not that fantastic. It's only about 30 plus percent. And what that means is that out of every 10 students who sit for the exam, there's only about three who make it. And that's not very good. Now, uh, before moving on into AAA, I want to tell you a little bit of a story about the British cycling team pre-2003. All right. Before that, they had, I mean, this is what record says, 110 years of mediocrity. They never won any prizes, no gold medals. They were always in number 10. All right. And what happens is that the top bike manufacturers, in fact, did not even want to sell the bikes to the British cycling team in case they got a bad name. You know, you've got a good cycle and then you come out 10 and it gives the cycle a bad name, right? So it was really hurting the, the British cycling team. So what happened was that in 2003, they brought in a new coach named David Brailsford. That's his picture over there. All right. And he had this relentless commitment to the aggregation of marginal gains. All right. And what he did was that he broke down the cycling process into small bits and pieces and then tried to improve every element of it one by one. So he started off with a person of the biker, their, their health, their diet, their cleanliness, their outfits, their sleep, their practicing habits in even the type of bike that they had to try and make whatever changes. So specifically, what did this guy do? This, uh, um, this coach for this cycling team, the British cycling team, he redesigned the bike seats to make them more comfortable. And the more comfortable you are, you don't have a pain in your butt. Have you ever been on a cycle for more than half an hour? Oh my goodness, the, the butt hurts. All right. So he redesigned the bike seats to make sure that they were comfortable. Then he rubbed alcohol on the tires to make sure that they had a better grip on the ground. So the cycling was a lot better. Then 
he brought in electrically heated shorts. Can you imagine? To make sure that there was an ideal muscle temperature for all the cyclists. Okay. I don't know what the ideal muscle temperature is. And then he put feedback sensors for all their muscles to monitor how an athlete responded to a particular workout. And what that means is constant performance evaluation as to what is working and what is not working. Then he got the um, the, the cyclists to switch their gear to indoor, indoor racing suits, which were lighter and a lot more aerodynamic. And because of that, they could cycle faster as well. Then they tested different massage gels to find out which one gave faster muscle recovery. They even hired a surgeon to teach the cyclists how to wash hands properly so that there was a lesser chance of an infection. And they also experimented on the different kinds of pillow and mattresses to give them the best sleep so as to enhance their performance the very next day. All right. Now, this guy here took five years. And after five years in the Beijing Olympics, they won 60% of the gold medals, not the bronze medals, the gold medals. Now, I know we don't have five years to prepare for the AAA paper. Your exam is only in a few weeks, but we have to understand what needs to change on an incremental basis, just marginal gains, just to make some slight tweaks. Now, I know you know how to study you have already passed so many exams, otherwise you will not be at the AAA paper. But just to make some slight tweaks and slight improvements that you can make, maybe 1% daily, just 1%, maybe a one mark increment. Yeah, we've got sort of 30 plus days left. If you can improve your marks by one mark per day, and that's 30 days, and that's an extra 30 marks for you, all right? So that's what we want to look at today. So the pass mark is 30%. And when you look at the examiner's report, the examiner's report is really quite scathing. And it tells the students what are all the bad things or wrong things that you're doing. But when you talk to the students, I mean, um, I chat on the students all the time uh, on, on Facebook, on, on, the, on the internet, they email me, they find my email addresses in my YouTube videos and they email me and say, I failed four times. I failed so many times. Help me. What is it that I'm doing wrong? So when I talk to them and I ask them, did you study the syllabus? They say, yes. Did you practice the past your question? They say, yes. And do you, do you know the exam techniques? And they say, yes. And it baffles me. How come the students who fail say that they have the knowledge, they have the exam technique, they practice the partial questions, and the examiner's report is scathing? So the examiner says that there is poor audit knowledge. So obviously, these students who say, I know, obviously, their understanding of what they know and what the examiner is saying is totally different. Of course, the examiner's report is a very general report, but still the examiner says poor auditing knowledge, especially on the area of audit reports. That's one of those big areas, okay? Then the examiner complains all the time about poor IFRS knowledge. So that needs to be improved. But when you ask a student, they say that they passed the SBR. And when you investigate further, what were the marks that you had in your SBR? And they will turn around and say that I had 50 or 51. And that's like really a very, very weak pass. So that may be a slight disadvantage. So all is not lost. All you have to do is in the next few weeks, make sure that when you're doing the exam question, uh, use that opportunity to learn up the IFRS correctly, at least that part of the answer that you are doing. All right, so that would be important. Then not relating the answers to the scenario. And in the AAA paper, if you do not answer the question to the scenario, then you're not going to get any marks. All right, and not understanding the requirements of the question. So there seems to be a mismatch. The student is saying, I know, and the examiner is saying, you don't know. So something has to change. And if you compare the student and the examiner, who is king? Examiner is king. So you have to listen to 
the examiner on what needs to improve. Something has to change. And this has baffled me for a long time as well, because students keep saying that they have studied and they have practiced, and yet they keep failing. So what's wrong and what has to change? Okay, so on this last part here, not understanding the requirement of the question, that one comes from exam question practice. I'll give you a very simple example that when the examiner says implications on the auditor's report, what is the examiner actually saying? What is the meaning of that? Or sometimes the examiner might say implications on the auditor's opinion to explain the implications for the auditor's opinion. Is there a difference between the auditor's report and the auditor's opinion? There is, so you need to understand that. If you're talking about the auditor's report, the exam technique here is that you have to consider the nature of the kind of modification, whether it is a misstatement or a limitation of scope. Then you've got to consider the severity of that problem, uh, whether it is material first and then whether it is pervasive, then you have to put down the right opinion and what do you need to write for the opinion and then put down the basis paragraph as well. Whereas if the exam question is only on the auditor's opinion, then you only cover the first three. So if you don't understand this, it's going to be like this. So the examiner asks you a question on implications for the auditor's report and you put down NSO, you unnecessarily lose one mark. Or the examiner gives you the question implications for the auditor's opinion and then you put down NSOB, then you end up wasting time. Because for the auditor's opinion, you don't have to put down the basis paragraph at all. So understanding the requirement of the question is actually really crucial. All right. So many students say, I've studied and I've practiced and I still keep failing. And that's very, very frustrating. And the students are unable to pinpoint the exact problem. So we need to find out what the problem is because it's very frustrating for students when you fail and then you feel a total loss, all right? So let's go through this. Many students study and practice and still fail. So now we wanna talk about your practicing, okay? Now this session here is not about triple uh, A topics, it's not. It's just talking about some of the study habits that need to be tweaked in order for you to win this game, all right? So remember, this coach is talking about the aggregation of marginal gain. Just make 1% tweak on different areas in improvement. And you know what? When At the end of the day, when you aggregate everything, there is going to be a massive explosion, a good kind of an explosion, all right? And so the first area I'm going to deal with is understanding your practice session marks. Okay, now I'm very sure that you have never heard of this before. Okay, so let's have a look at this. Supposing you're practicing a 50 mark question, your question one. So you do the whole thing and then you mark your answer the best that you can using the examiner's marking scheme. I'm sure by now you know how many marks you're going to get. And you tally up the marks for your 50 marker and you got 38 and you're, and you're celebrating because you know what? It's more than 25. Yeah. But hang on. You need to reduce your marks by 20% for self-review threat. Because the minute you see your answer, you would straight away know, oh, yeah, that's exactly what I meant. That is exactly what I wrote. But actually, it's not. So you're not the one marking it. Sorry, I'm not the one marking it. You are marking it. So there has to be a minus of uh, for the self-review threat. And self-review threat is real, I'm telling you. All right. So the net marks here are only 30.4%. But then, if you really think about it, when you do these past year questions, are you stressed? No. It's not a new question. You've done it before. And there's no time pressure. And the time pressure, yeah, maybe there. Maybe you, you are timing it. 
but it's totally different from when you're doing it in the real exam. In the real exam, you're stressed. In the real exam, it's a question you've never seen before. And in the real exam, there is a real time pressure. All right. So you know what you should do? Take that 30.4% marks that you got and maybe minus off another 30%. Discount it for the time value of money like you do in your present value discounting. Yeah, because that 30.4 marks are not real. You're not stressed. You have seen this question before. Someone has shown you how to do it before and there's no time pressure. So it's really not fair. Those marks are not a real reflection of your capability. So you've got your question one. So let's say in your practice marks, you got 35. Okay, and this is after all that discounting and all that. Okay, in the real exam, you will only get about 30. Why? Because... When you earlier, when you're doing the question practice, it's a question that you've seen before. You might be practicing the same question. You're quite happy with your marks. But when you're seeing something new, your performance may not be as high. All right. Now, question two. Maybe you're doing it and your practice marks are 12%. This is really quite common. Question two is usually a finalization and reporting question. And usually the performance is not as good as question one. All right. But in the real exam, you might only get 10 because you've got to remember that this one will involve accounting standards that you've not seen before, a new situation, a new scenario, a new circumstance, a new industry that you've not seen before. And therefore, your marks, well, can be higher than 12. But I'm just being realistic here. It might be 10. OK, and your question three is usually the worst question. OK, the one that we cannot predict. So if you add up your marks, let maybe you got only 10% of the marks, 10%. We're talking in terms of percentages, okay? And the real exam, you get seven. So if you add up the blue marks here, you're quite happy, yeah? That you've done a three-hour paper and you have got 57 marks. Oops. You're quite happy. And yet, in the real exam, you get 47. Have you been in the situation before where it is 47 marks, where it's 47 marks when you're practicing, it is uh, more than when the real exam marks come out. You've got 45, 46, 47, 48, 49. Has anyone done that? Can you type it into the chat? Have you ever been there before? When you're practicing, you get more marks. And in the real exam, you get lesser marks. I mean, tell me whether you can relate to this scenario or not. Yeah, so that's important because what, what I want to do is make sure that you understand this, that your practice marks are not the real marks. All right, totally different. Okay, let's go on further. So you do a full paper, okay? Now, let me explain this. Your practice marks could be between 40 to 60%. Like just now we had 57%, right? 40 to 60%. But in the real exam, your marks will be 45 to 55. Now, in my view, now we're talking about practice marks here, 40 to 60 marks in your practice time, talking about the full paper, is what I call a gambling category. What is a gambling category? Gambling category means I cannot guarantee your marks in the exam. You might be on 49. You might be on 50, depending on the type of question that you get on the day, whether you're ready for that particular question and whether you apply the exam technique or not. So I really don't know which way it's going to go. It can go either way. So can you see that when you're practicing the exam questions, you need to hit more than 65 during practice time? Why? Because you're not stressed. You're seeing an old question. You may not be following the time. All right. So during your practice time, if you get anything between 40 to 60 marks, you are in the twilight zone. It is a dangerous category. The exam can go any way. It can go into fail. It can be a marginal pass. All right. So what you need to do is that during your practice time, go more 
than 65, 70%. Now, this Mark Shear, I'm talking about after discounting it for the 20% self review threat. Yeah. Yeah. So go for that. And if you're not hitting those numbers for the old questions that you've seen, then you're just kidding yourself. I mean, just because you're sitting for the exam three times doesn't mean that you're going to pass on the fourth time. Although you might, like I said, in your practice marks, if you get between 40 to 60, then you are in that gambling category. It can form either way. It can be uh, 45, it can be 46, 47, 48, 49. It can also be 50. It's just your luck. I don't want to sit for the exam based on luck. That's ridiculous. The exam fees are so expensive and not to mention the price that your soul has to pay. The devastation, the frustration, the anger, the fact that your career is not progressing, the fact that everything that you love needs to be put on hold. All right. And that's a much dangerous, I mean, a much higher price that you have to pay, not just the exam fees alone. So it is only that when you are practicing and after you minus out the 20% marks, if your marks are between 65 to 70, you have a chance of passing. And that's the truth. All right. Now we're talking about aggregation of marginal gains. So I've talked to you about the practice session marks. So for your question one, your practice session marks, let's say you've got 35%. Okay, this is after minusing off the 20% self-review threat. You must mark your answer. I don't, I don't care whether you know how to mark or you don't know how to mark. Just mark. Minus off the 20% after that for the self-review threat. All right, you don't need an outsider to mark. And I've seen that uh, this 20% is really quite accurate. Okay, because sometimes I do mark uh, scripts for uh, you know, outsiders. Uh, that means not from my boot camp group. And uh, I tell them to mark it first, but I take their marks minus of 20%. It's always plus minus, very similar to the marks that I give them. So I know this 20% thing actually works. So you must mark your answer. If you're practicing question and you don't mark your answer, you're just kidding yourself that you're practicing. You're practicing in the dark, then you might as well practice with the lights off. Okay. The second thing is that, remember, we we're talking about aggregation of marginal gains, all those slight tweaks that you have to make. Look for the marks that you lost. I'm not interested in the marks that you have. That one you already have. I'm interested in the marks that you have lost. All right. Look for those areas where you got zero marks, maybe because it was a mistake. Look for those areas where you lost half mark. Look for the points that you missed. So you will find that um, when, you, when you compare your answer with the suggested answer, you can see there are certain points that you miss. Of course, when you look at the ACC answer, they put in a lot more points that you need. So make sure that you only find, uh, I mean, when you're writing the answer, it's only up to that certain amount of time that you have. All right, I'm not asking you to put down more points than you actually need, but look for the missed points. And, and the next thing that you need to do is try and think of why. Why did you lose that half mark? Why did you get zero? Why, did, why is that point that you made that was wrong? Why did you miss those points? So if you look at that, you are analyzing the 15 marks lost. In your practice, you got 35 marks, and now you're trying to find out where is that 15 marks. So if you can find those 15 marks, you will be able to stop the bleed of marks. All right? Remember, we're talking about marginal gains, just tweaking your study technique or your exam question practice technique so that you can win more marks. So what you need to do is write timed answers. All right? Mark your answer. Learn from your errors. Now, speaking about learning from the errors, how do you know what the errors are? Read the examiner's report and analyze the errors. Don't just put all errors in the same category. Not all errors are the same. And what do I mean by that? 
is it a calculation error that you're making? And I find that sometimes students make that calculation error when they are doing materiality calculations. They calculate it using the wrong denominator, or maybe it's just they saw the wrong number on the calculator. Maybe it's just their decimal point is wrong. So instead of saying 50%, they put their 0.5%. Okay. See with this exam technique error. Are you using the wrong exam technique for the, for the question? All right. See whether your mistake was that you applied an ISA wrongly or did you apply IFRS wrongly? You said that they should recognize a provision when a provision should not be recognized. So try and find that out. Or is it that you ignored the scenario? What kind of mistake that you made? Analyze the type of the mistake. And was it poor time management? So things need to be fixed, all right? And then be aware of gains and losses. Gains is what? You gain 35 marks. But what did you lose? 15 marks. Why did you lose the 15 marks? Go and find that out. Now, I'm not asking you to get 100% in the exam. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that you need to cut short the losses and you need to move into the category of 65 to 70 marks. The, the safe zone, not the gambling zone. All right, upgrade your marks. One mark at a time. Fix your mistakes. One mistake at a time. And maintain a record of your marks. You can only improve if you do performance evaluation, if you don't evaluate your performance and monitor your performance, you won't know whether you're losing weight. Sorry, not that we're losing weight, losing marks or not, whether you're gaining marks. And you won't even know whether you're ready for the exam. Of course, you've been studying all day, um, studying all day, but that's not a guarantee that you're going to pass. Joseph has got a question here. Uh, we are not going to mention anything about the ISA number or the IFRS number and no need to even say according to the relevant framework. You lose 10 seconds there when you're typing according to the relevant framework. In fact, most of the time when you type according to the relevant framework as a marker, I know that you don't know the standard. So don't give the game away. Even if you don't know the standard, never, ever, ever start your sentence with according to the relevant standard or relevant framework. Don't ever. Don't tell the marker that you don't know. Just put it down. A provision should be recognized if there's an obligation from a past obligating event and if there's a probable outflow of economic benefits and the amount can be reliably estimated. That's it. Keep it simple. Lesser words, lesser time, then more time to type in more answers as well. So the point down here is if you do not keep a record of your marks, you will not know whether you're going up or whether you're going down. You have to keep a record of the marks. Most of the time, students will do the question. I'm not sure whether they mark or not. They usually say they don't know how to mark. Do it the best that, that you can, minus off 20%. You have to know where you stand before you go in to the exam hall itself. Are we all right so far? Am I moving too fast? So what are we talking about here? We're talking about exam question practice. You need to practice it the right way, all right? If you practice it the wrong way, you are not going to get the results that you want, all right? So I have got a question here from Sakdev. It says, what if we forget certain parts of the answer? For example, we talk about uh, impairment and explain it most of the way, but forget to say impairment losses go to the SOPL. Um, you might get half a mark, okay? So on the area of impairment, if you're talking about audit risk, some of those points come out on a regular basis. You might as well just make sure that you know how to write them, okay? So you need to remember what you study as well. So that's very important, okay? Okay, so we're back here. Um, many students study and practice and still fail. Why? 
incorrect past year question practice. They never mark their answer. They never monitor their marks. They didn't minus of 20%. They don't realize the value of their marks, that their marks that they got is not really very high, although they might be happy with it, but it's not very high. And I showed you how that works. And the other part is incorrect study practice. So, you know, in your exam, you need to have knowledge, 34 ISIS. You need to know that. It's an auditing paper. Can you turn around and say, I only need to know seven? You're asking for trouble going into the exam inadequately prepared. So please make sure that you know the 34 standards. So in all your programs, all the standards are there explained in detail. But it is not 100% of the standard. If you actually go to the standards, some standards are up to 100 pages. You know, my notes are not up to 100 pages. I'm just putting down exactly what you need for the exam, for the AAA exam, right? 35 IFRSs, and this is where your SBR comes in. So I hope you've got strong accounting background. 36 requirements of the ACCA code. So when you go through the ACCA code, make sure you do a numbering. One, two, three, four. Eight, I've only got 34. What happened to the other two? Make sure that you know that you cover all the 36. It's so important. I've numbered them because that gives me a chance to monitor what I know and what I don't know. If I don't monitor them, I don't monitor the numbers, then how will I know what I know and what I don't know, All right? So we're accountants, we're very good at performance evaluation. Now, there are non-audit assignments that could come out in your question, three up to 15 marks. Please make sure that you know your four different non-audit assignment areas, all right? And, <clears throat> excuse me, there are some miscellaneous topics as well, like the area of regulatory framework, maybe NOCLA, maybe um, on the area of... Uh, you know, if it's a listed company, what are the implications and so on? You've got auditor liability. There's some miscellaneous, but uh, I mean, there's some areas that you need to cover. Okay. So now many students study and still fail. Just now we dealt with the practice. Now we're dealing with the study. They say they study. So what is the meaning of study? The the, the student's definition of study and my definition of study are totally different. I mean, like, for example, when your mom says cook and you say cook, the word cook is there, but it's totally different. Your mom knows how to cook. What is the best that you can do? Make a sandwich, maybe do a scrambled egg. It's still cooking, but it's not the same. So let's go through what do you mean by study, all right? So that we, we, we don't misunderstand. So you need to have correct study practice. Now, I'm not talking about waking up at four o'clock in the morning or studying all day. I'm, I'm not talking about that. This is not that. I'm talking about making marginal improvements in your concepts. So the first concept that we dealt with just now was to do with understanding your practice session marks. What is the meaning of the marks that you get? Now we're looking at study practice. So the first thing here. So when you're studying, we're talking about learning. Okay. Now the danger here is this. That you have sat for audit and assurance before. And therefore, now when you see maybe the word written representation or letter representation, you recognize the topic, but you don't know the topic. So if you are resitting, I would suggest that when you see a topic like letter of representation, learn it properly. Make an effort to understand it. Now, learning is different from just recognizing it. Recognize means like, for example, you open your car bonnet, you see the car engine, and you can recognize it's a car engine, but do you know anything about the car engine? No. So learning is totally different from recognizing. Recognizing simply means that when you look at it, you know what it is. That's it. It doesn't mean that you, you have learned it. So the next step is you need to understand. Now, what do you mean by understand? How do you know whether you understand something or not? 
of course, we can do partial question. But what I'm talking about is this during the study time. We need to, first of all, know what it is. We need to know why you need to have that. Why have a letter of representation? When do you get a letter of representation? How does it work? When does it not work? You need to know that. Same thing with your IFRSs as well. You need to know what, are, what is the recognition criteria. You need to know what are the measurement rules, all right? And you need to remember. So sometimes students only do the first step. They don't do the understand. They don't do the remember. They skip it. They're in a hurry. They don't have time. All right? So without understanding it, you're going to the exam. You are going to misapply that knowledge. So that's not good. All right? So you need to remember. How do you remember? Give me some ideas, guy. Can you type it into the chat? What are the methods that you use to remember? Mind maps, very good. Yeah, that is. It, it might take five minutes extra. Yeah, acronyms, very good. And, well, a recall, very good. Active learning. So I use mind maps, all right? I use pictures, like for example, and, and I use acronyms. So let's say we're talking about the recognition criteria for investment property. I use pictures and, and acronyms as well. So what I have is I've got this picture of this huge building. Imagine a huge tall building sitting on a block of ice. All right. An investment property sitting on a block of ice. So you've got I-C-E. So I is the intent. Yeah, <laughs> the intent. And C is that the building must be complete in its building. E is it must be empty of owner occupation and empty of related parties. So I use pictures and acronyms together. And Joseph is saying here, dots and boxer shots. Yeah, that's a picture that I posted in the WhatsApp group. So the more you have these, the more it helps you remember. And some of you were saying recall, yeah. So uh, creating mind maps is part of active learning and recall is also very important. So how do you recall? Recall is you can talk to yourself in front of the mirror or you can teach someone. Now, I know we've only got a few weeks left, but the important thing is you cannot always keep saying, I got no time, I got no time, I got no time and then study the wrong way and then end up failing. What's the point? You might as well not study at all. Do it the right way. Yeah, cut down on all your time stealers. And I've already shown you what are the time stealers. T TV is right on top with Netflix. They've got so many awesome shows, social media. Yeah, that's another one. And well, there are another seven others or eight others. Okay, so we, we have always got to be aware of thieves. Yeah, the thieves that steal our time. All right. So you need to do this. This is called proper studying. And you need to make sure that you have deep work, meaning that while you're learning, understanding, and remembering, make sure that you're locked up in a room without your handphone nearby and you do some serious work by yourself. And that's why waking up at five o'clock in the morning is really so good because no one is texting you at that time. Yeah. So uh, that's it. There's that, 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 that some here. So. Many students study and practice and still fail. Why? Last minute study. I've, I've got one student that, that told me uh, the last round. I mean, he's not for my program, but it says, I tried my best. And I thought, wow, this guy has been studying so hard. And I asked him, how did you try your best? And he said, I took three days leave before the exam. And I'm like, yeah, that's just wrong. How can you study your best in the last three days? It doesn't make sense. So the student's definition of best and the examiner's definition of best, totally different. So what's the definition of best? In my case, for AAA, appropriate question practice. What is appropriate question practice? Make sure that you mark your answer, time your answer, uh, study the mistakes, analyze the mistakes, don't make the mistakes again. 
that is called appropriate question practice. Anything other than that is not called best. It's below best. And if it's below best, then your marks will also be below best. Okay. And the other one is correct study practices. Not having deep work, not following, learn, understand, and remember. Okay. And many times when people prepare for AAA, it's the last thing that they do. They give their best to their work. They give their best to everything else, to social media, to TV, to everything else. And then at the end of the day, when you've got final 20 minutes, when you're dead beat, then you're saying, I'm studying AAA, I'm giving it my best. That's not the way to go, guys. All right. If you really want to pass, then it should match with the priority that you're giving to AAA. First thing in the morning, after you shower, you have to shower, otherwise you won't wake up, all right? So shower, have your cup of coffee, maybe exercise, shower, and then have your cup of coffee or whatever. Make sure that you're wide awake. Take two glasses of fresh orange juice early in the morning and you will be wide awake. Give your priority to AAA. Respect AAA and AAA will give you the marks. You disrespect AAA and the marks will be less than satisfactory. Okay, so there has to be some sacrifice, a cut down on your TV time, on your family time. Just talk to your family, negotiate, and tell them that just bear with me for the moment. Support me for the next few weeks. Just for the next few weeks, I really need to pass. See whether they love you enough to do this for you. All right. So we're talking about aggregation of marginal gains. So that book, The Atomic Habits, talks about the British cycling team and what the coach did. He just brought in 1% increment. And within a short period of time, they had 60% of the gold medals in the Beijing Olympics. We're not waiting for five years and we're not going to the Olympics. We're just talking about the triple A paper. So what were your marks the last time? 45? You make this incremental changes and your marks will launch to 70. That's what we want. All right. You already got 47. You already got 45. Okay. And the rest is just to launch you into a safer zone. All right. 1% daily improvement in everything. What that means is the focus is lower. Daily. So you need to daily do this. Every day, wake up at five. Okay. And... Uh, I'm not saying because you have to wake up at five. I'm saying that if you do it late at night, when you come back after your boss has squeezed all your energy out of you, what, what energy is there left for AAA? There's nothing left. Everything has been squeezed out. So do it early in the morning before you go to work. All right. So 1% daily improvement in everything. So daily improvement in what? Your practice session marks, be aware of that. Minus off the 20%. Okay, don't overestimate your knowledge. Students always say, I know, I know triple A. I don't know how I failed. How can that be? The examiner did not pass you. So there has to be some point in time where you come to the realization that I actually did not know enough. We're not saying you don't know at all. I actually did not know enough. If you can come to that realization, it will be the first step to moving forward. Just admitting that you were not good enough in the last session. All right, I know it's painful, but as long as you keep saying, I know, I know, I know, which means that you're not looking out for the mistakes, which means you're not going to improve. Okay, the first thing. Second one is analyze the type of errors. Remember, we're talking about improvement. So I'm not talking about the technical stuff. We're not talking about ISO 610 or anything like that. We're just saying the method that you're using. If you don't analyze the type of errors, then you're not going to learn from them. If you don't learn from them, chances are you're going to be repeating the old mistakes. And that's why people who repeat the exam keep getting the same marks. So that's not shocking. That's just 
the way it is. If you don't deal with the fundamental mistakes that you're making, the marks will not improve either. And the third one is make sure there's sufficient time for study. Give AAA a priority. Some of you, your ACCA expiry date is coming. Your credits are expiring. You cannot afford to fail. All right. Make sure there's sufficient time for study. Negotiate with everyone. It doesn't matter within the next one month whether you mop your house or not. It really doesn't matter. You hoover or whatever. Okay. Just put aside all the non-essential work. You don't have to suddenly go and clean all your pantry and all your kitchen cupboards or whatever, or wash all your curtains. I mean, that one is non-essential. Do all of that after your exams. Find the time. Negotiate with people. Uh, I, I used to uh, joke with my students, put your handphone in the freezer. I'm not, not literally, but uh, put it in a place where you cannot hear it ring and put it far away from you because neuroscientists say that when you keep the handphone with you, it actually reduces your cognitive ability. Yeah. So when your phone is near with you, uh, let's say, for example, I say Apple. Okay, and you picture an apple, but the picture of an apple will come a microsecond slower compared to if you did not have the phone in the room with you. Right? So make sure you got sufficient time for study. Do a timetable, and I've already done a timetable for you, what you need to cover. And if you've already done that, just tick it off and saying, I've already done this, I have learned, I've understood, I remembered, and do the regular recall as well. Do not underestimate how challenging this exam is. In fact, I would advise you to prepare for the worst triple A paper ever seen. The worst. Prepare for that, and you will be able to pass this exam. All right.